Paul Horn, and uh, I'd like to, to welcome you to this uh, webinar uh, on integrated pest management. Uh, it's been organised by the World Potato Congress, and uh, it's an, in anticipation of uh, hopefully everyone being able to uh, travel once again and um, might see you all in, uh, in Dublin, in Ireland. Uh, so my topic is IPM or Integrated Pest Management in Potatoes. Um, a little bit about me and the company that I run. Uh, it's a very small company called IPM Technologies. Uh, we're based in Australia. Uh, we normally travel all over Australia and elsewhere in the world, but uh, the last 12 months has been mostly uh, in local areas. Uh, we established the company about 25 years ago. And as you can imagine from the title, uh, we're focused on, on IPM. So we don't sell any products. We're a private company, but what we do is to help farmers and their advisors to develop and implement uh, IPM strategies wherever they may be and in whatever crops. But for all of that time, um, we've had a strong focus on IPM in potatoes. So the, I'm an entomologist, and so the focus of this talk will be uh, on insect pests and how to control those pests. And I'll be using Australian uh, potato crops as, uh, as an example. So firstly, if I just run through uh, the control options for any pest in any crop. So our, our belief is that there's really only three, three options. Pretty much anything that you can think of can fall into one of these categories. So the first is uh, biological control where the uh, insects and mites, uh, other invertebrates that eat the pests, they're the biological control agents that we're concerned about. Cultural controls are simply any management tools that are available to, to the farmer that can have an impact on either the pests or the biological control agents. So it can make life uh, worse for the pests or better for the biocontrol agents. And the, the third control option is uh, chemicals or pesticides. But in an IPM system, we, we see the chemicals as being a support tool, not just the, um, the mainstay of control. So integrated pest management is really very simple. It's trying to use all the available options in a compatible way. So if we can get uh, three control measures working together, that's better than just basing it on, on one chemical option. And usually what uh, is required is that someone does some monitoring so that decisions can be made on whether um, any chemicals need to be applied or any further cultural options need to be uh, put in place. So if I put that in a slightly different way into a table, uh, starting from the left, we'd say in any crop, we farmers have to deal with a set of pests. So whatever those pests are, there'll be beneficial insects, biological control in, uh, agents that can work against them. Uh, the third column there is the cultural controls and the last column is the pesticides. <clears throat> so you can see pretty clearly in this form, if you're using only chemicals or pesticides, then you're only using a third of the available options. So we'd like to try and fill out this table in whatever crop we're looking at and see um, what, what are the options that are available. They're not all going to be compatible. They're not all going to be used. But if we can complete this table, um, we have the basis for an IPM strategy. So why do people use IPM and not just rely on pesticides? Unfortunately, uh, in our experience over the last 25 years, uh, people come to us when there's a crisis. 
And the most common crisis is when pesticides stop working due to insecticide resistance. There's also other reasons pesticides get withdrawn either by government decree or uh, by the companies that make them no longer selling them. No one wants residues in produce and that's uh, a driver in some cases. And of course, uh, insecticides can have uh, uh, safety issues. And so uh, if the less pesticides people use, the, um, the less worries they have to have. There's also something that is less well known and that is the problem with induced pests. And that's where putting a pesticide on can actually make pest problems worse. And at, towards the end of this, this talk, I'll, I'll give an example of um, where we've seen pests induced in potato crops. So as I mentioned at the start, I'm an entomologist. We'll be talking about pests of potatoes, invertebrate pests, and I'll use Australian examples just to illustrate it. Um, there's a whole range of pests that we have to deal with. So I've just selected a few for the purposes of the webinar today, just to, to show you the principles that, uh, that we operate on. And uh, sorry, I forgot to say at the start, if uh, anyone wants to put any questions to me at the, at the completion of this, this webinar, please just use the, the Q and A function and uh, I'll, I'll be able to read them and respond at the end of the, the session. So what I've started to do here is, is fill out the, um, the table with a, a set of pests. And so the pests I've nominated are some that are most commonly dealt with in Australian potato crops. Potato tuber moth is one, aphids, and these are aphids that are, are pests uh, where pretty much wherever potatoes are grown. So in particular, green peach aphid, potato aphid. We also have thrips as vectors of virus. So aphids and thrips are, are problems because they vector viruses, not because usually not because of the direct feeding damage that they do. And I've nominated just caterpillars in general, uh, different places around the country have different caterpillar pests that they vary in importance. But this gives uh, a set of pests that um, typically growers in Australia might have to deal with. So I'll just show you a couple of pictures of uh, one of the main pests is potato tuber moth. So the adult moth is, is quite small. It's probably a centimetre or less in length. Uh, it flies very uh, weakly at dawn and dusk. So it's not usually very common to see it, but uh, it's, it's one of the major pests in, in Australia and New Zealand also. Uh, it's a leaf miner in the caterpillar stage. So the picture on the right shows uh, the feeding damage within the leaf of a potato tuber moth caterpillar. So there's a caterpillar inside there and they tend to get tracked towards the mid vein. So on the left there, if we crack open that, that leaf mine, we can find a, a caterpillar inside. So in Australia, the potato moth is um, a pest in, in the field and it can damage tubers that are exposed at the end. In, uh, in countries where cool storage isn't available, so where they put potatoes into warm stores, tuber moth damage after harvest can be far more significant than, um, than in the field. And so the tuber on the right shows damage by the caterpillars feeding within the tuber. Uh, it's not a problem for us in cool stores, uh, but I just want to acknowledge that in, you know, in other countries, it's a very different situation. So the next um, set of, uh, or the next part of the table to fill out is the beneficial insects. So for potato moth, we have parasitic wasps and uh, damsel bugs, which are nabids. Um, they are the main biological control agents. <clears throat> for aphids, there's parasitic wasps, ladybirds, lacewings, hoverflies. All of these are, are very significant. All of them occur naturally. 
So none of these things need to be bought or introduced artificially. For thrips, there's predatory thrips, predatory mites, predatory beetles. And for caterpillars, depending on the size of the caterpillars, uh, each have their own set of parasitic wasps and either damsel bugs or shield bugs are the, uh, the main predators. So I'll just show a couple of pictures of these. Um, Hoverflies as, as adults are nectar feeders, so they're not predatory in themselves, but they lay their eggs usually where there's, there's aphids or, or other suitable prey as offspring. So the larvae are, are legless, headless, they're maggots, um, but they're quite capable of walking around in the canopy of a crop uh, and they feed on, in this case, typically on, on aphids. One other predator that we find in extremely high numbers, especially in spring, uh, are brown lacewings. This is a native Australian one, but there's uh, e ecological equivalents all around the world. So this one's Micromus tasmaniae. So the adult is predatory, but it's not the major life stage that's predatory. It's the brown lacewing larva, and in this case, the, uh, the, the larva is eating an aphid. So it's uh, got hollow jaws and it grabs the aphid and basically sucks the, the liquid contents out of that aphid and kills it. So they're uh, voracious predators and they can be in huge numbers in crops. To give you an idea how many there might be in a typical potato crop, this photo shows brown lacewing eggs on the underside of a potato leaf. And there would be about 25 or 30 on this, this leaf. And that's not unusual to walk through a crop and find this sort of level of lacewings on every plant. This, they come in in springtime from, uh, from other areas, the native species, but they feed in a wide range of uh, low growing crops. So, you can imagine if there's this many lacewing eggs on every leaf, then pretty soon there will be lacewing larvae on every leaf that are going to have a significant impact on uh, aphid populations. I mentioned damsel bugs. These are uh, very slender predatory bugs. Uh, they've got a very long proboscis and they can actually feed on potato moth larvae even while it's inside the leaf mine. There's predatory thrips. This is a native, the red, the red thrip here is a, a predatory thrip and you might be able to make out underneath it is a very pale nymph of a western flower thrip and so the predatory thrip is feeding on the pest thrip. So they're just some of the predators we have to deal with. And now I'll just show you some, a couple of pictures of the parasites. This is uh, a wasp parasite, Orgulus lepidus, and the, the wasp is able to detect caterpillars feeding within the leaf mine. So the cue for the wasp is chiromones given off by the leaf in response to the caterpillar feeding on it. So it can sense that and it can track the, um, where, where its host is. And so the female wasp will sting the caterpillar and a maggot will develop inside the caterpillar. And after some time, uh, the wasps will emerge. In this case, one wasp will emerge from one potato moth caterpillar. There's other species that are polyembryonic. And in this slide, um, there's four four caterpillars in different stages of the parasite's development. Down the bottom is what might initially appear to be a healthy caterpillar, but it's got a few funny bumps on it. Uh, and then those bumps turn into little cells. Each one of those cells uh, contains a wasp maggot pupating. And then they turn black and a little black wasp will emerge to complete the cycle. These are very small, uh, but they can have a big impact. The point I'd like to make here is that the 
difference between the predators and the parasites is that there's a couple of important points. The predators walk up, eat their prey, and the results can be seen immediately. But parasites are hidden for the bulk of their life within their host. And so parasitism is often underestimated because the parasites can't be seen. The adults are very small or very elusive and the, um, the maggots inside the caterpillars are not, not noticed. doesn't mean they're not there. The second important factor is it takes quite a lot of prey individuals. So let's say aphids being preyed on by a ladybird it takes a lot of aphids to uh, feed a ladybird from, from egg through to adult. So when it hatches from the egg, it has to eat a lot of aphids before it's going to uh, complete its life cycle and turn into an adult ladybird. But it only takes perhaps one um, aphid or one caterpillar to produce one wasp uh, parasite. So in this case, this is a, a female wasp in the process of stinging an aphid. And what it's doing is putting its egg inside that aphid will look like an aphid f until the, the wasp uh, turns it into a cocoon and puffs it up into a little ball. And so then you can tell that they've, they've been parasitized. But until then, it's not, uh, it's not seen. So, so predators are obvious. Parasites are um, less obvious for most of their life. So we've got the, the two there. Um, predators tend to be a cleanup of a pest problem and parasites can be very good at maintaining biological control at a very low level. So the next column I'd like to fill out is the, the cultural controls. And so these are things that the grower has control of. Doesn't mean in all of these cases, it doesn't mean they all have to be used. But these are some of the options that growers have available to them. So with potato moth, the main cultural controls rely on there being soil cover over the tubers to prevent the moth laying eggs on the ground and caterpillars having access to the tubers below the ground. So if the ground is cracked or cloddy, uh, the, uh, the caterpillar damage can be quite significant in the field. The variety is important. High setting varieties are much more susceptible than those that are deeper setting. Similarly for aphids, the growers can choose to use certified seed rather than keeping their own seed. Uh, weed management's important. And for seed growers, isolation uh, from, from main production areas can be an important um, control option. The same sorts of controls for thrips and this is because they the main issue with these pests is their virus transmission uh, not their direct feeding damage so just uh, australian potato crops uh, trying to produce a big hill to maintain that that soil cover um, overhead irrigation is a really good way of uh, maintaining that soil stopping it cracking, obviously done for other reasons, but at the end of the season, uh, growers can use irrigation uh, instead of putting pesticides on. Uh, many, many years ago, I went to Yemen and looked at potato crops where they were using furrow irrigation. And the problem with that was uh, as soon as the water uh, disappeared, the ground cracked open rather than, you know, the overhead irrigation seals the ground the furrow irrigation actually cracked the ground open and so damage by potato tuber moth was actually very significant. Um, here I've got a, a photo of a, uh, a crop where the, the grower has kept weed control at the end um, sort of to a very high level and that's mainly to stop thrips breeding up in, in weeds right on the edge of the, the crop. So weed control. All of these things, there's many, many more. These are just examples of cultural controls. So the last option is pesticides. And I said at the start, we see the chemicals being a support tool, not the mainstay. But one of the most important things we need to know 
is what pesticides do to beneficial species, not just how good they are at controlling the pests. So in our lab, we do quite a lot of testing, um, not for how good the pesticide is on the pest, but what does it do to beneficial species? And obviously that varies depending on what species we want to look after. So on this, I'll take a moment to try and explain this slide. This is a way we've tried to summarize the data. So for a few different species, uh, beneficials, each has got a letter to code it, and each of the horizontal bars, so this, the top one there is acromite, uh, the bar goes from 0%, which means it's pretty harmless to beneficial species, or down to the red end where it's 100%, uh, it's, it's highly disruptive. And what you might notice just at a glance is that the letters, uh, let's say, look at the fourth one down, indoxicarb or avatar here, um, it's totally safe to some species, it's quite disruptive to, to others and highly disruptive to a few. Similarly with Confidor further down the list, um, it's, it's disruptive to some, uh, less so to others. So what we want to know is if, so this is a way of ranking pesticides one against another for how much impact they're going to have on the beneficial species of interest to you. So you can look at it and you can say, all right, it's safe to this species, it's highly toxic to the other species. So you then can choose which pesticide is more appropriate out of those available for the target pest that you've got. So we choose the pesticide, not just for its impact on the pest, but for its impact on beneficial species. That's a very rushed view of that, that work. If anyone wants to look at it, we've created a database and it's available on, on this web website, which is the Biological Research Company. To, to illustrate how important choosing the right pesticide is and how disruptive it can be if you choose the wrong one, we had an opportunity a few years ago, quite a few years ago now, where a farmer that we worked with had uh, made a mistake basically when he chose uh, a fungicide to be applied by plane. So this particular grower hadn't used any uh, insecticides that were disruptive. He hadn't used any at all, in fact. Um, but he had a regular fungicide spray program and he wanted a fungicide called ACE to be applied. But when he sent his email, he actually pressed X instead of C. They're right next to each other on the computer keyboard. And, and so his email read, please come and spray my crop with ACE. Instead of that, the plane started spraying his crop with a broad spectrum insecticide, which wasn't what he wanted. And uh, as soon as he realized, he called the plane off. And by that time, half a crop had been sprayed by mistake with a synthetic pyrethroid, a broad spectrum insecticide. We were monitoring that crop and we looked at aphid levels on either side of the paddock. So we had half a paddock that was sprayed, half a paddock not sprayed. This graph here shows the percentage of leaves that had aphids on it on the two sides of the crop. So the red line is the unsprayed side. So numbers of aphids didn't go up very much. But on the side that got sprayed with the synthetic pyrethroid, it took four weeks and then every leaf we turned over had aphids on it. Now the difference between the red line and the blue line here is a very good measure of the impact that biological control agents were having on aphids until they were disrupted. So what happened was the synthetic pyrethroid didn't reach the target pest, but it did kill all the ladybirds, lacewings, hoverflies, parasitic wasps that were keeping the aphids under control. And then we had an exponential increase. So I can see two generations of aphids there over that four weeks, which had no biological control 
and the chemical control wasn't uh, enough to, to, to get control. So I can talk about that more later if you want, but uh, it's a pretty good uh, indication of how good biological control is until it's disrupted. I should also say that we recommend sprays like Axe after crop senescence to help protect the potato crop. So it's not that Axe in itself is particularly bad, it's just the timing uh, of when this went on was highly disruptive. And this is the level of aphids that we found in that crop. So there's winged aphids, wingless aphids, uh, there's a lot of aphids there. And so that's because they breed very quickly and there's no biocontrol going on. So I'll finish off with the last column. And what we've got is a range of pesticides that if necessary, we could use against the target pests. And the reason we've chosen these particular products is this is not the new spray program. These are just the support products that are available if necessary if the biological and cultural controls aren't enough. You can see under every case I've written not often required. So when we uh, monitor crops for growers, they can choose to use these, but often there is no need. And so uh, the biological control and cultural controls working together can give uh, adequate control in most situations. But there are chemical options there to support if necessary. So just quickly want to say, well, what happens if we get a new pest in? And so that's happened recently in Australia. We have tomato potato psyllid arrived in Western Australia. It's not on the East Coast yet. And um, when it arrived, we didn't know, or before it arrived, we didn't know what beneficials might eat it. We didn't really know what cultural control options might work apart from uh, hygiene, in particular quarantine. And the pesticides that were used if we chose broad spectrum insecticides, that uh, would kill the pest, but you can see I've removed all the biological control agents for all the other pests. So it will kill pests, but it might actually create pest flare by releasing um, the, the other pests that are non-target to that. So what we've done is found that the same biological control agents, predators here, rather than parasites, but they're all predators, they all eat potato psyllid. We've just left hygiene as the main control. And so in Western Australia, which is the only place it's been found, potato crops haven't been required um, for, for controlling this pest in potatoes. If we did need it, I've listed a, a range of pesticides there, which could be used as border sprays in the initial stages. And that's the approach that we would start with anyway. So what I've tried to show here is how we develop an IPM strategy. Uh, there's no IPM strategy for a particular pest as such as uh, potato psyllid, but there is IPM for the range of pests in the crop. The next stage, the final stage, is well, how do you get adoption of IPM? And that's one thing that we think we've been very successful at in Australia. And the way we've done that is by giving in-field demonstrations to uh, whoever grower and advisor is interested. And we think it's important to have those two together. So we get the grower and advisor together at the start of the season and we're usually showing them things they're not familiar with, making decisions they're not initially comfortable with. So we give recommendations on all pest management, including pesticide options to suit that grower at that time. And we've done this with all sorts of potato production, seed, ware, processing, they've all used this approach. So we get to show the grower and advisor, this is the problem, this is how we deal with it. And at the end of the season, growers have seen the crop produced, the advisors have seen how the decision-making worked 
as the season progressed and hopefully there's a crop at harvest that they uh, can see. This was grown using IPM and it works. For those that are interested, there's a, an industry magazine called Potatoes Australia and a grower that we worked with and have done so for uh, over 20 years, uh, when we met him, he would normally deal with insect pests by putting an insecticide on roughly every two weeks, maybe a little bit more if he thought there was a problem. He said to us that since changing to using an IPM approach, he's, less, he's used less insecticide in total in the last 20 years than he would have used on a single crop before that. I think that's pretty powerful message of what's possible. It won't be the same for everyone, but certainly it's, he's gone from relying on a pesticide-based approach to using IPM and has had excellent results. As I mentioned at the start, we run a, a very small company called IPM Technologies. You can contact me by uh, our website if you're interested, or you can e email me the both of those uh, details are there. Um, so I think that's the, the end of the, the presentation. Um, I would just like to thank the organisers uh, for asking me to uh, present this, this webinar and I, I hope people found it of, of interest. Uh, I'll close down the, uh, the PowerPoint talk and uh, I'm happy to take questions uh, if you want to use the Q&A function. Uh, and I'd like to thank Nora Olson in particular for uh, helping me get, get all this going and for, for giving the uh, presentation. So thanks for listening and uh, I'll uh, stop the sharing. Yeah. So I'll just, I've got a few questions here. I'll start, start with, um, someone has asked, was Copidotsoma introduced in, in Australia? Um, there's, they were introduced into Australia, two species, I think, um, quite a long time ago, probably before the 1970s, uh, as was Orgulus lepidus and the Pantales subendinus. These three, um, vary in importance. Uh, Copidosoma is probably the least important in Australia, but it's present pretty much in every district. Uh, the, main, uh, the main parasites we find were uh, Orgulus and Apantales, and they can reach levels of 70 to 80% parasitism towards the end of the season. So the person asking the question says in the USA, you can't find them. Um, we've found them, um, all three species that are potato moth parasites, in high numbers where um, pesticides, uh, certainly broad, inspect, broad spectrum insecticides have been taken out. Um, so there's another question about the safety of pesticides or IPM programs in general to pollinators. Um, we probably look at this more in other, other crops, but um, we've, the side effects guide that we've put together probably takes into account, you can get a guide from that, the relative impact um, on pesticides to pollinators as well as the key biocontrol agents in potatoes um, by looking at which groups you're interested in. So there's a lot of non-bee pollinators, of course, as well as, um, as bees. So we don't have information on bees as such on our website, but we've got information on you know, wasps and flies, which are the usual other, other pollinators. Um, Another question is on uh, potential changes to insect populations and IPM approaches as we experience global climate change. Um, I guess we're seeing some changes in insect populations here. Uh, I can't say they're directly linked to 
to climate change. More uh, importantly, probably for us, is that uh, we try and make the agricultural ecosystem suitable for beneficial species. So that is the potato crop itself is, and what is sprayed on it in particular is more important than uh, any broader issues. Having said that, these biocontrol agents all come into potato crops from outside. And so whatever's going on in uh, other regions around can also have um, impact on um, uh, pollinators that, yeah, that are you know, just passing through. Uh, there's a question about, is LSO found in Australia? If so, biological control may not be an option. Um, LSO so far hasn't been found in Australia and it's the only country in the world where the psyllid is without the, um, the, the LSO as well. But uh, I'd probably disagree that biocontrol may not be an option. Biological control is just one more, um, one, sorry, one component of control. And so what we would do and what I tried to put in that final uh, slide was using chemicals and biological control together. So we're not relying on biological control at all on its own. Um, we would have the option of using biological control agents with pesticides so long as they're um, uh, so yeah so long as they're compatible so uh, I think in WA uh, the level of biological control has probably is much higher than other parts of the world because Australia has a lot of psyllids different species and a lot of things that eat psyllids. So biological control agents here are probably higher uh, in number than elsewhere in the world. Um, there's a question about economic insect thresholds, especially as it pertains to pathogens of insect vectors. So that's where it, it's going to vary enormously. Um, if there's uh, certified seed being used if there's a low level of virus in the background obviously then you can tolerate more um, potential vectors things like aphids or thrips if that's not the case uh, then it's almost as soon as you find um, the the vector it's time to do something but all I'd ask is that people look at, well, what's the level of biological control going on? And so if you had 100% parasitism of aphids or even 80% parasitism, uh, you're going to get control of those vectors. And so it's not just the sheer numbers, but it was um, also, it's just a risk assessment. Um, I'm just flipping through the questions. There was a question, how do I adjust IPM? Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'd say that when, when we run through filling out that table, um, we do it for each, not just each location, but almost each grower, because each grower will have, or each location might have a different set of pest issues. Uh, each grower might have uh, a different threshold for, for pests or tolerance of pests, tolerance of damage. Uh, so certainly the IPM needs to be adjusted to suit the conditions and the grower. What I, I didn't mention, um, but I can now, is if if a, we were to compare maybe a conventional grower with an organic grower, they might be neighbors on either side of a, a wire fence um, both have the same set of pests both have the same set of biological control agents both have the same options for cultural controls but an organic grower just has a smaller uh, list of pesticides to choose from so uh, that means that the 
if there's less chemical options, probably they're more likely to put effort into some of the cultural controls. There's a question on what's the impact of in furrow insecticide applications. Uh, where we've seen things like Comfidor Guard, where um, imidacloprid used in furrow, the, um, there's been very minimal impact on beneficial species. It is rate dependent. And so there may be a very brief period where there'd be secondary poisoning by um, the pesticide impacting predators that are eating multiple numbers of um, sucking insects that have uh, ingested the insecticide. But in our experience, it's been very, very minimal. Uh, there's a question about um, what's a typical IPM program for control of aphids in seed potato crops. So the seed potato, we've worked with seed potato growers here and a lot of them have moved to using IPM because of problems uh, with pest flare when they're using broad spectrum insecticides. So they're often uh, not tolerant of, of any level of aphids. And so they would probably use um, more uh, pesticides in terms of uh, applications for, for aphids than a conventional grower, uh, sorry, a ware grower or a processing grower in the same area, just because of the perception of risk. So we would suggest in most cases, starting with um, uh, an in furrow application of something like Comfidor Guard to give protection early. That's not disruptive to beneficials. And then I listed several uh, insecticides that were uh, compatible with biological control agents. And so uh, they, they're listed on that, on that table. And so there's, there's probably about four products here that um, in Australia that we can use, and I'm sure are elsewhere in the world, that are safe to beneficial species, but will give control. So spacing those through the life of a seed potato crop, um, just mixing it up to avoid resistance problems and um, uh, spacing them out through the, through the life of the crop. Um, there's a question about have certified seed growers used IPM for potato virus Y management? Well, I think uh, it, if we're controlling the vector, so the aphid, it's how best to control um, the aphids. And then the cultural controls is uh, using certified seed. So the combination of those two things, the biological control, first of all, uh, certified seed, to reduce the initial virus uh, level. And then, as I just mentioned, there's a range of um, soft options that people uh, can use uh, so that you build a strategy. So you're not re just relying on pesticides and you're not just relying on biological control. So yes, certified seed growers, I would say, can certainly expect to control the range of um, viral transmitters that they're concerned about. Um, the last, I think this is the last question I've got. Can the same strategy be applied in stored tubers? Uh, pretty much all the talk that I've given has been to in-field uh, control of pests. Stored tubers, uh, it's a very different thing. Um, so the cool store for us is the, is the cultural control that we would use. Um, I think it's probably uh, not something I would say I've got enough experience to uh, to give an answer about that if it was in warm stores. But no, I think it, it's a different different method. So I'd take take my talk uh, and comments as applying to in field. Um, I think that that is all the questions that have been um, 
I think I've answered all that <laughs> those that are on the uh, Q and A panel. So uh, I think I'll I'll close it down there. I thank you all for for listening and uh, taking part, and I, I I hope you got something from it, and I also hope to be able to to meet some of you in Dublin when travel opens up again. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>